Hey, good morning, Here's Mr. Swanson here, and we're on day five of Greek week. Unfortunately, I can't be in the room with you, so I'm going to try to give you a bit of an audio companion to the, to the screens that you will see today and try to talk you through how you can navigate these screens. Uh, a good idea would be to have this video going with my voice, this video going, but maybe you're still on the slides and you can click through the slides as we go. Or I'm going to give you instructions every now and then to pause, watch a particular video, come on back to this video. Uh, as you can see, I am I have recorded my, myself with the, the screens on the screen as well. Hope this works. So let's take ourselves through Greek week, day five. Welcome to World History. Let's go. So I want you to first ask yourself, this is a bit of a journal question. So just jot it down on some scratch paper. If you don't, it's not going to be a turn in journal. Just jot this down on some scratch paper. If you could choose only one weapon, one to use in a fight, what would you choose and why? One weapon. Think about what is a weapon. All the things that are possible to be a weapon. If you choose one weapon to use in a fight, what would you choose and why? Go ahead and pause this if you need to so you can think and write down your answer. Once you answer the question, go ahead and continue. I'm moving on. This is class, we're going to talk about Athens of Sparta. We're going to talk about democracy, the military, Alexander the Great, and Hellenism. Some mega topics, really important. Um, I'm going to try to make it interesting for you. I'm going to infuse some other videos other than just myself throughout the presentation. So here we go. Athens versus Sparta. No, I'm not talking about Athens, Georgia, but I bet some of you just like stood up and respect life between the hedges. You understand Athens. No, let's talk about Athens, Greece. So ancient Athens, Greece was known for some very particular qualities. It's intellect, it's architecture, it's democracy, it's philosophers. Uh, you went on a virtual field trip in Athens just yesterday. So you, you can kind of put yourself there. You can kind of feel like you've been there, right? So this is uh, ancient Athens. Um, I want you to take a few seconds to explore the link down below. Okay, it's a really good link, something I never could have come up with on my own. So go ahead and let's use this resource of dkfindout.com. Uh, spend about no more than five minutes here, right? I'm trying to give you some time hacks to get through this presentation. So go ahead and explore that link for no more than five minutes uh, and then come on back to this video. I'll pause. Okay, I'm back. Uh, from Athens, uh, we get what we call still today the humanities. So what the ancient Athenians were known for, contributions to philosophy, math, astronomy, medicine, literature, philosophy, religion, all of these things that were kind of began in ancient Athens, we still study today. And in fact, maybe you've heard this phrase, the humanities. We still call a, a whole topic of education the humanities. And in fact, this social studies class that you're in right now fits into the, the humanities. So the ancient, the ancient Athenians kind of pioneered the idea that it's important to study history. Uh, and so you're sitting in a humanities class right now. Other, other humanities um, in the world today would include language classes, uh, maybe psychology, sociology, philosophy, creative writing, literature, uh, et cetera. So the, the humanities uh, is started in ancient Athens. Now let's talk about Athenian democracy. Super important piece of ancient Athens is that they pioneered the idea of democracy. And some of you are like, yeah, America, democracy. Well, we're going to see how Athenian democracy is a little bit different than, um, uh, than present day, you know, United States democracy. So the word itself, now we say it real simply today, right? Democracy. We say it all the time. You turn on the news, CNN or Fox News, you're going to get, uh, you're going to hear the word democracy. Well, it's actually a Greek word. And it's kind of a compound word, right? Just like grasshopper, grasshopper. That's a compound word, two words put together. Well, democracy comes from demos, which means the people, and kratos, which means power. So if you were to put those two words together, you would get democracy, power to the people. The people have the power, you know, a little bit we the people, United States Constitution, right? So this Athenian democracy has been around since 500 BC. So we're talking about 2006, 2,600 years, um, uh, 2,500 years ever since democracy has been, been around. Uh, the Athenian democracy, very similar to uh, our three branches in American government. Okay. Um, they almost have a, they essentially have a legislature, an executive, and a judicial branch. Uh, not identical in its numbers, right? They didn't have a single executive like we have the president. Um, of note, in the ecclesia or the assembly, this will be like their legislative branch, all Athenians could attend the assembly. And this is what's going to make it direct 
democracy. So we're going to talk a little bit more about direct democracy here in just a second. Uh, and then of note, they kind of pioneered the idea that you could uh, you could have a, um, uh, a trial by jury and the jurors would be a group of your peers. So probably drawing a little bit from the ancient code of Hammurabi, the first written down code of law. Uh, but now we, uh, we we're expanding the idea into everyone has a right to a trial by jury and a jury of your peers. Uh, we're going to see that in the American Bill of Rights as well. So direct democracy, simply put, means one person, one vote. And you're like, well, that's the way it works in America, right? My dad goes to the polls. My mom or dad goes to the polls and they cast their vote. Well, we actually have in America, it's called a representative democracy. They're casting their vote for a representative who then goes to Congress and represent and, and then votes the way that they would prefer, right? That, that person is not beholden to the way that, you know, you want them to vote. They can vote their conscience. They can vote their preference. So we have a representative democracy. Direct democracy literally means one person, one vote. If you look at the picture, it's kind of like a small town with a, they're maybe having a town hall meeting and they're raising their hands to vote. This direct democracy works when the community is small enough that literally every person could be counted in a reasonable amount of time. We have the best democracy possible in a representative democracy for the size of our country. But a direct democracy becomes possible in a smaller environment, which Athens could support. We're going to see this again in America, uh, in the Puritan communities that would pop up in the New England colonies pre-American Revolution. So see how I'm drawing some U.S. history into this world history class. So direct democracy pioneered in Athens, Greece. Compare that to a representative democracy, the conversation I pretty much just had. Other representative democracies, Canada, South Africa, many modern day representative democracies. Again, it's the idea of democracy, but the size of a nation, the size of a community is just too large to support one person, one vote by raising your hand. Uh, so we vote for representatives. So direct democracy, Athens, representative democracy, America. Why don't you go ahead and take a second and watch this video right here if you haven't already. I think I infused this into another lesson earlier this week, but if you, if you haven't had a chance to watch this yet, go ahead and watch this video uh, and you'll feel like you have lived a day in the life of an ancient Athenian. All right, that was Athens. Now let's talk about another polis, Sparta. Yeah, you might think they're both Greek, right? Don't they have some common characteristics just like they're from the same country? Um, Greek city-states were essentially nations unto themselves. They may have been identified under the larger group of Greece, but they were very much nations unto themselves. And Sparta had a distinctly different personality than Athens. Sparta was known for its military. Equality for women was a very important idea in Sparta is that women were the same as, as, as men. Uh, and it was run not with a democracy. So we can make a direct contrast here. It had an oligarchy which is a small group of rulers, usually elite, usually rich, usually not very representative of the people. So an oligarchy. Uh, same as you did with Athens, go ahead and spend five minutes on this dkfindout.com um, uh, website, exploring Sparta a little bit. Pretty cool interactive website. So go ahead and tinker with that for about 15, uh, five minutes. I will pause here. And we're back. How'd you like that website? Is it cool? Pretty cool? Okay, moving on. Let's talk a little bit more about the Spartan military. So their lifestyle was embedded in the military. And, you know, we, we get that iconic, stereotypical Spartan warrior from Hollywood, from folklore, uh, the movie 300, the book Gates of Fire, just some art renderings you see of an ancient Greek warrior. You're always seeing uh, a Spartan warrior. Uh, you see red. Red was iconic for the for the Spartans. You might see the Lambda logo on their shields um, uh, and, and just Sparta set the standard for uh, other Greek warfare. Spartans set the standard for Greek militaries. Um, their entire community was rooted in being a being a, a warrior. So from young, from age young uh, up to their you know adulthood, um, their whole culture was focused on being professional warriors and conquering and their lifestyle followed that as well. The way that we see their one of the ways we see their lifestyle follow this is this idea of the agoge. Agoge is when a young person would be who's coming of age and coming of age really means between ages five to seven, they are taken from their family and put into uh, a training platoon, okay, a military environment, age five, starting at age five, and they're trained to be a warrior for the rest of their life. Uh, by age 10, you know, it's their education as well. They learn to read and write. They, they get basic school 
um, maybe the humanities, but again, that's associated with Athens. They get schooled, but with a particular sp uh, specific focus on uh, physical dominance, physical prowess, and, uh, and military skills. So, you know, by age 10, they're learning to read and write, and their physical exercise is greatly increased by age 12. They're pretty much full embedded in the uh, culture, singing tra uh, training songs and warlike war cadences, and their military training began in earnest. So this is the agoge that is referring to young people being taken out of their families and put into a military environment for uh, just immersive training. Some of you may get this. Uh, I find that students typically don't understand this and my point gets lost, but the Spartan race company that does the Spartan races, which is a, a mud run, 5K, 10K mud runs, they actually have a training program called Agoge. And that's a logo you see at the bottom of your screen there. So just kind of capturing the idea that um, everyone wants to live a Spartan lifestyle. You know, they, they basically monetized the Agoge and saying, hey, come join our training program, come run our race and you'll be like an ancient Spartan. Isn't that cool? You'll see a YouTube link at the bottom of the screen. I'll call that an optional video. Uh, it's a clip from the movie 300 that shows a young boy being taken out of his family and put into the Agoge. So maybe just brings the Agoge to life for you a little bit. Um, not everyone survived the Agoge, right? And part of the Spartan lifestyle is that they only wanted the strongest people possible. So um, occasionally training people or, you know, students uh, would die inside of the Agoge. However, those that survived were deemed to be Spartan. Those that survived were deemed to be good enough. Uh, that was part of the weaning process. I'm not saying it makes sense to us today, but that is very much what their attitude was at the time. Finally, at about the age of 20, this, per this young man has become a man. He's become a full soldier. Uh, and with that, he becomes a Spartan citizen. So military service is the same thing as being allowed to be a citizen. What if that was a value in our culture today? You're not a citizen, legitimate, full-fledged citizen until you served in the military. That'd make things interesting, wouldn't it? Uh, and then from then on, his whole life was devoted to the army. Moving right along. So from the Agoge, we also have a Kryptea. Kryptea is a uh, almost like special forces, right? If you want to use that term, a Kryptea is like special forces, the most able, the most intelligent, the most elite. And a real unique piece of the Kryptea, one of the, one of the training trainings that these individuals had to go through was that they would have to, young people, young men would have to kill a slave uh, in order to earn their way into the Kryptea. And what we have here, this picture here, this is an artist rendering, of course, and I've had to couple, cover up a couple spots on the, on the, on the painting here, but uh, take a second to analyze all the faces there. I think we have dad. Dad might be a, a, a longtime member of the Spartan military. He's a member of the Kryptea, the special forces, and he's bringing his sons into now the Kryptea. Clearly on the left-hand side, we have a slave. And I like to analyze that person's face. It's almost like, what is he thinking? What is he trying to say? And then we have the young man with his hand on his hip. Uh, I would say he's the one probably going through this trial right now. Even in the background, you have a woman, you have a Spartan woman. What is she thinking? What are the other onlookers thinking? Take a second to analyze this photo. Uh, I think that your, your conscience will probably be shocked because what we see here is way against our cultural values, um, but is very, very normal to the Spartans at the time. And this is one of our mega themes in world history. Not everybody has done things the way I do them now. And that's OK. We try to understand what was normal to them, try to analyze the history as it was in context, uh, even if it shocks our consciences in the present day. Moving right along. Oh, I, I feel like the crypto is a whole lot like the Hunger Games. Right. I mean, going to go out and hunt down a slave, uh, have to kill him in order to survive yourself. Sounds a whole lot like the Hunger Games to me. So just an example of how modern day literature reflects ancient history. Here is a, a couple screen grabs from uh, that clip. If you watch that clip, it shows the young boy being taken away, the young boy being put into the Agoge, potentially the Kryptea. Uh, pretty powerful little clip, uh, you know, Hollywoodized, but I, I think uh, I would have to think uh, on uh, at least captures some of the themes and emotions of what could have been accurate. All right, a mega important idea in the uh, Spartan military was the phalanx. Funny word, right? PH, phalanx. What that means is their fighting formation, and it was how they used their shields and spears to fight as one unit. One man coming to one man alone is not as strong as all the men together. But yet one man could be the crack in the phalanx in the fighting formation. So everybody had to rely on each other to for the unit to be strong. And you can see here, I'll go back to the moving image, you can see how their shields would move. 
And the shield was actually not for you. The shield was for your buddy next to you. So your buddy on your left, your shield protected him. But guess what? Your buddy on, on your right hand side, his left side shield protected you. So the shield protects the person next to you because it's a left handed thing. You're holding the shield with your left. They valued right handed individuals and actually left handed individuals. If you couldn't become right handed, you might be cast off. You might be sent away as unfit for a service because you're not right handed. So if you're a lefty, raise your hand right now. I guess raise your left hand. Yeah, you'd have to go. If you're left handed, you'd have to go. Um, so you can see the fighting formation here. It turns into it's, it's a box. They would advance even inches at a time. But because of them all being together, the strength, of the phalanx was everybody working together. Um, this is what made the Spartans dominant at the time. I think uh, here's a pretty good overhead image. And you can see these spears extend a little bit farther than in the first image. Um, and you can see how the guys on the front lines uh, have their spears forward facing the enemy. But then there's guys in the back and they're ready to just kind of run on through. If the first guys go down, they're going to lower their spear and the phalanx will keep on moving. And then this is a bit of a graphical representation, but it's it's contrasting the strength of the phalanx to individuals fighting without organized military maneuvers. So on the left, what, here's your big life takeaway. Fight like an individual, you'll go down. Fight as a team, work as a team, and you're stronger together. So pretty good contrast in how, now I got it. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a video game representation, but Come at it, fight, fight as individuals, no good, fight as a team, and you're the strongest military in the world. How about that? Uh, a little bit more, pretty much everything I've already said. I'll give you a chance to read this slide. You can pause the video and read the slides. It was one of the most effective military formations in the world at the time. The strength lay in the discipline of the team, not just an individual soldier. Uh, and once the soldiers were packed tightly together, they would move forward uh, even inches at a time. And the strength of the phalanx was able to cast off the lows of anything, anyone coming at them. Um, and the strength was in the tight, packed teamwork and disciplined soldiers. So go ahead and watch this video now. I think it's a five minute video. I will say, okay, I will give you the option to not watch it. I will say there's some blood and guts in this video. Um, so you can, you make a choice for you, whether you want to watch this video or not, you can bypass this video. You're not going to miss any test information. This is a super Hollywoodized version of, uh, of the Spartan military, the battle of 300, the battle at the hot gates. Basically, the story is that 300 Persians were able to stand in a little tiny gap in a mountain pass, and the 300 of them were able to plug the hole. They were able to fill in the, the, the very small trailhead, and the million-man Persian army was, was unable to get through. So now, historically speaking, the Spartans were eventually overrun, but the, the courage and the fighting of these 300 Spar uh, Spartans, plus a couple thousand other Greeks, the Spartans get all the all the all the news and all the press. Uh, so there were 300 Spartans, but there were a couple thousand other soldiers from other city states as well. Anyhow, uh, the movie here focuses on the 300 Spartans. And what you can take out of the video is uh, the way that the phalanx works. So go ahead and pay attention to the way the phalanx works. Have you watched the video yet? Have you watched it? If you haven't watched the video yet, pause. Okay, if you watch the video, come on back to this question. Remember what I asked you at the beginning of the hour? If you could choose only one weapon to use in a fight, what would you choose and why? Now, you may have said something super normal like a gun. Okay, I want to bring a gun to the fight. I want a cannon. I want a nuclear bomb. You may have just gone to the biggest thing possible. Some of you like a guy on top right. I'm going to scrap with my fists. Flip the question on you here. What do you think the Spartans would have chosen? If the Spartans could bring only one weapon to the fight, what do you think they would have chosen? I think they would have chosen their shield. The point I want to make here is that sometimes it's not the um, the really casual deproducing weapon. Okay, it's not the maximum weapon like a gun or a nuclear bomb. But the Spartans would have chosen their shield because it represented the strength of their team. So uh, kind of a interesting way to turn that question upside down and take that take that into your teamwork. Take that into your your softball team and your football team and your cross country team and your band and your youth group. Take that into any team you're a part of and start to think like that. Start to think that the most valuable thing I can bring to this organization right now is my teamwork, my discipline, and my willingness to be there for the team, not as an individual, but as a member of the team. Just want some big life advice in the middle of ancient Greece. How about that? 
All right. So uh, something else you saw in that video was the uh, the Persians. OK, the enemy. He said, Spartans, lay down your weapons. And the King Leonidas Gerard Butler response was Persians come and get them. Right. He demanded lay down your weapons. And then their Ooh, awesome response was Persians come and get them. Well, in Greek, that word would be molon labe. And this has actually become kind of an iconic phrase, present day military culture, like molon labe, come and get them. A lot of people are going to use this for um, Second Amendment messaging, right? If the government's trying to take your weapons, if the government's trying to constrict, restrict the, the rights to personal firearms, uh, someone might say molon labe, come and take them. Uh, we've seen this elsewhere in history as well. This is actually a, a battle flag from the battle of or the, the fight for the Texas Republic, the War of the Texas Republic in 1836. The story of this, and you can see it says, come and take it, right? Similar sentiment, come and get it, come and take it. Similar, uh, what, what happened here was that this is the Battle of um, Gonzales, uh, not the Alamo, okay? It's a precursor to the Battle of the Alamo. But long story short, the Mexican army had at one point loaned this cannon. And you see this little tiny cannon on wheels, loaned it to Texas settlers, and they were called Texians, uh, for personal defense, right? P defense of the community. Well, once the Texans started rising up and being stronger, and essentially they were now opposing the Mexican army, the, uh, the, the legitimate government of Mexico, the Mexicans said, hey, by the way, give us our cannon back, you're right? We loaned it to you and now you're opposing us, so give us our cannon back. Well, the Texans came out and in Gonzales, Texas, and they had this flag, which looked like this, right? This is the actual flag. And it had the cannon on it, and it said it has one star, which is going to be going to represent the Lone Star of Texas. And the flag says, "Come and take it." Right. So very similar to that Spartan attitude: lay down your weapons. No, nah, come and take it. So just a little bit of extra historical significance there. I actually have a "come and take it" flag in the classroom. We'll try to we'll, we'll fly it next week, maybe. How about that? All right, take a second and just reflect on this uh, chart right here. So we've talked about the differences between Athens and Sparta. Uh, and this chart kind of sums it up pretty well. Um, and then at that, pause the video if you need to to look at that chart a little longer. Or, of course, you can pull up the Google Slides. Uh, then go ahead and watch this video, which is a contrast also of Athens and Sparta. So watch this video for a few minutes. Manage your time in class. Uh, I, think, I think you got time to do it all, but I know sometimes I put... 15 gallons into a 10 gallon hat because there's just so much learning to do. All right, pause, watch this video. Go ahead and come back to my audio guide here when you're done. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, guess what? There were other polises, poli, poli, polises in Greece as well, okay? It wasn't just Athens and Sparta, even though they're the two iconic ones. There are other polises as well. Corinth, Corinth, this is actually the Corinthians of the Bible, first and second Corinthians. Paul wrote a letter to this polis. They were actually known, best comparison is that they were like Las Vegas, okay? Sin City. Uh, that's what Corinth was known for. Thebes, Syracuse, Argos, Rhodes. You see the map there. Each color chunk represents another polis. So not to, to make the point that uh, it wasn't just Athens and Sparta. There were a lot of other city states out there as well. Mega idea is that each polis had its own form of government. So even though united under the Greek empire a little bit, each city state was behaving in its own way. So democracy, oligarchy, dictatorship, etc. like each polis has its own form of government. Big idea. I need you to remember that one. Let's move on to Alexander the Great. Uh, and no, not Alexander had Alexander had a really, really bad, terrible, awful day. Not that guy. We're talking Alexander the Great, one of the greatest military commanders of all time. You may remember this image. Socrates taught Plato. Plato taught Aristotle and Aristotle mentored Alexander the Great. So somewhat indirectly, Alexander the Great is receiving the, the teachings and mentorship of these three big philosophers. So, yeah, that guy, that's the Alexander the Great we're talking about. The man who changed the course of history, one of the world's greatest military generals of all time. He created this vast empire that stretched from Greece, okay, Macedonia, Greece, to Egypt. That's northern Africa to as far as Southwest Asia. That is a, that's pretty, kind of the extent being India. And I'm going to show you a map here in a second. Conquered much of the known world at the time. Now, conquered is actually kind of the wrong word because he didn't go around as a conqueror. He actually went around and tried to unite these uh, territories that he entered under what is known as a Hellenistic culture. He tried, he brought Greece to them, uh, but instead of conquering and enslaving, he actually, one of his big strategies was to have his soldiers marry into the local culture. So now we have intermarriages 
And, you know, you're, you're kind of not inclined to fight someone that, you know, if you just married, you got new in-laws from India, you're probably inclined to grow in India. You're probably inclined to make that culture as good as possible uh, versus conquering it. So uh, intramarrying was one big idea. And then actually he brought people back to Macedonia. So he brought, say, India was the extent of his uh, Asian conquests. And he brought some Indians, uh, the native, you know, the, the country, India, back into Macedonia. So very strategic young man. And I say young because he died at the age of 32. His entire conquesting happened uh, before age of 32. Um, but he is known for spreading Greek culture around the known world. And that's called Hellenistic culture or Hellenism. So Alexander the Great. This photo here is actually a, an artist's rendering of what he might have actually looked like in real life, taking art and sculptures and any artifacts we have available. If you'll open up the Google Slides, there's actually a note that has a hyperlink to an article talking about this artist who made this picture. I just think it's fascinating to not think of him as a stone sculpture, a marble sculpture, but actually like this really human form of Alexander the Great. So a little side history there. If you got a chance to read that article, um, go ahead and man you know, manage your time in class, but that's a pretty interesting article. So our man, Alexander the Great, uh, go ahead and do watch this video as well. Animated. I think it's 10 minutes long. So manage your time in class again. But most important person in history. This video is going to do a great job of summarizing it. So pause. And we're back. Helenism, just a little bit more about Helenism. Again, it was the spreading of Greek influence into West and Central Asia, Asia as far as the Indian subcontinent, North Africa and Egypt. Going to talk a little bit about towns named after Alexander the Great in a second. Pause the, pause the video if you need to read the slide. Here's the extent of his campaign. So, you know, on the right hand side, you see him getting into India. On the left hand side, you see him in North Africa. Of course, he's all over Europe. Uh, and the Greek city-states at the time as well. So wide conquest of the known world at the time in 300s BC. Helenism, again, just uh, is this fusion, this, this merging of Greek culture with the local cultures. So Greek mixed with Indian, Greek mixed with Egyptian, Greek mixed with Asian, uh, taking Greek religion and actually we'll see, we've talked a little bit about Buddhism, Greek and Buddhism connected. We see Alexander the Great um, con, uh, in Buddhist temples in Asia. We see Alexander the Great in Egyptian art because he was conquering inside of Egypt as well. And it's taking the humanities. Remember art, literature, theater, architecture, music, math, philosophy, sorry, taking the humanities and bringing them around the world and then also merging, fusing them with the local culture as well. So this is what is Helenism, uh, really responsible for taking cultures that were kind of maybe just stuck inside of themselves. Like we are only Greek, we are only Indian, we are only Egyptian and connecting them to each other. So broadening and expanding someone's worldview in that awesome to know that there's more than just you out there in the world isn't awesome to know that someone else lives slightly differently they might have a nice tradition that you you want to connect with this is helenism a time when greek culture dominated europe and southwest asia again in a blending fashion greek culture being brought to europe and southwest asia being blended with the local culture Finally, Alexandria. This is Alexandria, Egypt. It is a, a city founded by Alexander the Great, obviously named after him as well. It became a trade hub on the west side of the Nile. So the way that the delta, the Nile flows from south to north, and then the, the delta is in north Egypt, it'd be on the left-hand side as you're looking at a map, the left-hand side, western side of the Nile. It was a large harbor. Of course, a harbor is good for trade. Ships from all over the world would come to, the, uh, come to Alexandria, Egypt, and it was a trade hub for many countries. And then it was kind of a merging point for all this culture, right? All these cultures are meeting uh, at this one location in order to do trade with each other. But of course, they're naturally trading their clothing and their philosophy and their literature and their religion. Like all these things are being traded uh, inside of Alexandria, Egypt. And then finally, something super unique inside of Alexandria was a large library. Uh, as merchant ships came to Alexandria, Egypt, they were actually ordered, commanded by law, however you want to say it, to um, give a copy of any books they had on board. They had to send over the books they had on board. These books would be hand copied. And then that way, the, the Library of Alexandria grew and grew and grew and grew and grew from all the cultures that were coming into Alexandria, Egypt at the time. So it's the world's largest library. It was a collection of all 
knowledge of the known world at the time. And then guess what? It caught on fire. After 250 years of collecting knowledge in 48 BC, it was set afire uh, by Julius Caesar's troops during a battle in Alexandria. Some will say it's an accidental fire. They actually set the ships on fire and then the library caught on fire as well. Maybe it was set on fire as retaliation, purposeful fire. Either way, doesn't matter how the thing started. It did start and many books were lost to history. And we actually can't even possibly know what was lost to history because it's burned. And we can't know what it was. And that's very unfortunate. If you're a historian, you should cry at night, every night, over the burning of the library at Alexandria. Very sad, very sad. So there you have it, the library at Alexandria. Uh, one more video for you to watch, depending on how much time you have in class. Guys, I haven't asked you to do anything today in terms of taking notes or an activity of any sort. I just want you to plug into the learning. So I hope you've been able to browse all these slides and all these videos uh, and just have a, have, a, have a go at putting it in your brain. One last topic, if you have time, I didn't infuse this into the military portion just because it might be a little bit extra. One more piece of technology in Greece was the trieme. Uh, you know, I don't speak Navy very well and I don't like to advertise for the Navy, go Army, beat Navy. But the trieme was a pretty revolutionary piece of, uh, piece of war machinery. And I'll just let you browse it right here. You can see that it was paddled from underneath. Well, of course, a lot of times it was slaves who provided the power uh, and gets to a really interesting this is an optional video. This is a modern recreation of a trieme. And then this is a uh, another Hollywood video it comes from the movie Ben-Hur, but it shows what battle in the trieme might have been like. Uh, pretty good video. Again, I'll give the blood and guts warning. You don't have to watch it, but you're welcome to. Try to place yourself there. Try to think what it would have been like to be on the trieme, to be a soldier or a sailor, Navy. Yeah, sailor, be a sailor. Uh, on a trieme. And uh, if you have time to watch this video, go go for it. So uh, that's it, guys. That's today's presentation. Greek week. That's a wrap. Um, what I would ask you to do at this time is to make sure that your notes are good and make sure that your five W's for the week are good. And um, try to stop sharing my screen here and just talk to you directly. Make sure your notes are good. Make sure your five W's for the week are good and turn them in by the end of the class. Sorry that I had to miss these last two days with you, but I think we've done a pretty good job of getting it, getting after it even from afar. I hope you feel smarter about Greece. And uh, uh, next week we will jump into Rome. And let's not forget that we have the uh, unit test. Unit one early civilizations test will be on Friday of next week. That is Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, and Rome. I'll have a study guide coming at you. If you followed along as we've, uh, if, you, if you've tucked in and paid attention as we've gone along, you will be just fine on Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, and Rome, Unit 1, Early Civilizations. Mr. Swanson, love you, mean it. Raiders, out.